them on fire that guy that does the PowerPoints. <laughs> Messing him up. I'll have to get on to him. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I uh, just want to thank everyone for coming. Today we're going to be talking about faith, hope, and love. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, uh, beginning with the first chapter, it says this. And we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. For in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and the Father, let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day, and I pray that you would speak through your imperfect vessel, Father, that you would speak through me today to your people, Lord, that we might learn what you have us to learn today, that we might grow in faith, hope, and love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, the Apostle Paul, he opens up by commending the church uh, of the Thessalonians, and the Thessalonians epistle was written to the church of Thessalonica. It was a church that was up under a great deal of persecution at the time, uh, and it, it, it really has this dynamic testimony but it, the great thing is, is that even though they were under such great persecution, the, th the church was thriving. And that should give us great hope today that, you know, listen, we might feel that, uh, you know, people in the world, they look at us as being antiquated thinking, that uh, just kind of old-fashioned type of thing. Nobody lives that way anymore, and that's, that's just old stuff. But I'm here to tell you it was working, right? You live a life of, of, of a Christian life. I've lived both, right? I lived a life apart from Christ. And let me tell you something, life with Christ, even though it has been difficult, it's been so much better than it is certainly without Him. But here they were under uh, persecution, and uh, you know, the, 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 but the church continued to grow through that. Uh, it was a, a, a church in the New Testament times. It was kind of a booming city. It was about a city of about 300,000 people. And the, the city was conquered by the Romans uh, in uh, 168 B.C. It was made uh, into the capital of Macedonia. And when Paul made his journey to the city, it boasted at that time 200,000. Uh, it consisted mostly of, of Greeks and the large Roman population. And there was a, a strong... Jewish minority, though, uh, but its location it really contributed to the, the its importance. It was probably one of the greatest cities in the England uh, uh, nation road, uh, great military highway uh, which connected Rome with the east. So it was a really important, and also for its uh, harbor, which made it a naval station uh, for the Romans. Uh, the commercial activity it had a couple of important uh, results. First, it made Thessalonica a very wealthy city. So well-to-do Romans, they settled there, uh, and the Jewish merchants were attracted by the commercial advantages that were going on in the city. And secondly, one of the things that it brought to, along with the great wealth, oftentimes it had a reputation of being evil and licentious. So kind of give you a little bit of background of what was going on at that time. So. Uh, knowing these things about that, when we look at what Paul was writing, it, it kind of puts things in, in perspective, right? So here, uh, he says in the second verse, it, what, he talks about giving thanks to God always for them, making mention in the prayers. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So here, Paul, he opens up by giving, giving thanks to God for the church members. And how many know that that's where our thanks belongs? You know, it's thanking God. Because, you know, I, I don't care any good that I can do, right? Any good that I can do, how many know that I couldn't do it unless God gave me the ability to do it? Yes. And here we are, you know, I like that song, I Surrender All, right? And when he's talking in that song, he's talking about, I surrender all the glory and the praise. I release everything. So no matter the good that we do, I mean, we often think about the bad and we thank God that His mercy and His grace is for us when, to receive forgiveness of our sins or when we fail or we stumble, and that's wonderful. But, you know, the, the, when we do have successes, how many know part of us want to take a little bit of credit for that? Well, look what I did, you know? Look what I gave. Well, the fact is, is that when we come to the point that we give everything to Him, 
We give Him all the glory. We give Him all the praise. I couldn't so much even praise God unless He gave me the breath to do it. Amen. I couldn't do any good unless He gave me the grace to accomplish it. You know, so even if I could do something in my own strength, I still have to give glory to God. And that's not taking some kind of a, 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 a false humility, you know, and say, well, everything belongs to God, but then secretly wanting it for yourself. Yeah. But when this life beats you down so bad, you know, and it just crushes you, it's easy to say, you know what, none of it's me. None of it's me. And I thank God, you know, the, the other song that we talked about is The Scars. When I first heard that song, I have to tell you, I'm like, I ain't thanking them for those scars because, I mean, that really was horrible. It was horrible, the things that go through. But, you know, I know that my Bible says that God commanded light to shine out of darkness. And even though I couldn't see, I couldn't see any good coming from what I've gone through, I know that my God is good. And I know that He can bring good out of just about anything. Amen. Amen. So here the Apostle Paul, he mentions three cardinal graces here in the third verse. Faith, hope, and love. Let's talk about faith for a moment. Paul mentions the work of faith and he discusses, you know, and, and, and we, we oftentimes, and I know we have here, we talked about, you know, works and faith. And sometimes we think of these as being two separate concepts. Uh, and Paul argues that, the, that our works really demonstrate our faith. He says in James 2, 18 through 20, look what he says here. I'll give you a moment to turn there if you want to turn in your Bibles. Uh, or if you'd like to look up at the screen, it says this. But some, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. He says, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is what? Dead. So here Paul, he teaches that really truly that our... Uh, did I miss it? There we go. That our faith... Uh, that our works demonstrate our faith. And that, that is important. We talked about this, and I've said it before, that you can do good works and not be saved. Right? right? But it is impossible to be saved and not do good works. So if you're in doubt, listen, do something good. Right? <laughs> I mean, just do something good, right? Uh, because you, you can't, you know, it, it is, you can't really be saved without them. Not that the works save you. The works just demonstrate the fact that you are saved. Can I get an amen? Amen. You will live what you believe. <coughs> Let me say that one more time. You will live what you believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, in psychology they call what they call cognitive dissonance, and in, and what it is, it's a mental discomfort experienced by a person who simultaneously hold uh, two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. Right. Uh, the occurrence of this cognitive dissonance is a consequence of a person performing an action that contradicts their internal belief, right? So what we want to do is people want to get away from that discomfort. So if you're doing something that goes against your belief, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to either change your belief or you're going to change your behavior. That's what you're going to do. You're going to change your belief or you're going to change your behavior. So, uh, for example, if you believe that lying is wrong, for example, and you find yourself telling a lie, you're either going to justify to yourself why you told the lie to try to distance yourself from any of those negative feelings, or you're going to change your behavior. What are you going to do? You're going to repent. You're going to say, God, you know what? I'm going to own up to it. I was wrong. I need your forgiveness. Right? That's what it is. And so you, you've got an example of... of, of you know, that is an example of someone who really believes that lying is wrong. But there's another case. What if you were raised to, to, to think that drinking or doing drugs is wrong? And you find yourself in a place where you start drinking or doing drugs. Now, you have a choice. You can either change your belief or you can change your behavior. 
right? So what happens if you change your belief? You start to believe that drinking alcohol or doing drugs really isn't that bad. You know, I mean, have you ever got around a, a, a real pothead that this like can try to convince you that smoking dope is the best thing in the world? You know, that it has all these health benefits and that, you know, <laughs> it's just like, it's like a miracle cure for anything and everything. Uh, but, I mean, I've been around people like that, right? Uh, but the fact is, is that, uh, but m what, what happens is, is that most people will try to, if they, they start to believe that, they'll seek information around them or they'll get around people who have those same beliefs, right? And in order to it, uh, avoid that cognitive dissonance. So much in the same way, that's how faith is either weakened or strengthened, right? So if you have faith, you're going to live like you have faith. You're going to live your beliefs, right? You'll surround yourself with others who have faith, and you know what you're going to do? You're going to start avoiding the people who don't have faith. Do you want to be around people who are constantly negative? Constantly, they just don't know the Lord, and it's like, you know what? i got to separate from this because that is wearing on me. Right, and so so that's what ends up happening. You you can you if you don't have faith, and you're confronted with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what do you do in that case? You can either again change your belief and surrender to the gospel, uh, and and ultimately and ultimately doing that is going to change your your behavior because if you change your belief, ultimately your behavior begins to change as well. Uh, or if someone rejects the gospel message and they still experience this internal discomfort, then they're going to seek what they call, they call that confirmation bias, right? It, it's a tendency to search for or to interpret or to favor certain information that confirms one's beliefs, right? I'm going to go out and I'm going to Google something until I find me something that agrees with what I already believe. And, they're going to, and then what you'll do is you'll kind of ignore the information that, that typically goes against those beliefs. So when a person doesn't want to change their behavior, they look for reasons why. I can't tell you how many people I've witnessed to. And, and, and it boils down to that. That one thing. They don't want to change the way they live. They don't want to believe because you know what? Believing in a God... It's going to force you to change your beliefs. And so many people, they just don't want to do it. Uh, so let's bring this all the way back around. Like I said, ultimately, that, that most people, they will live with what they believe. If you have faith, it's going to be evident in your actions if you truly have faith. People say that they are believers. If they truly are believers, they're going to live like they believe. I can't tell you, I, you know, I was down at uh, the Stark Prison years ago and I went down to lockdown wings and we were witnessing to the people in these lockdown. Now the lockdown wings is that's the prison within the prison. That's where people are stuck for 23 hours a day. They get out for an hour a day and that's because only because the state mandates that. And I remember walking up to the, you know, the you're on this catwalk and I walked up to this one prison. It was kind of dark and uh, you know, and I, I asked the guy, I said, do you know Jesus? He goes, well, I'm a Catholic, you know, and he just thought by simply being born into a Catholic family that he was saved. And I, I, I just begin to, to tell him that I believe that wouldn't God be unrighteous if he accepted you simply by the fact that you were born into a family? What happens when someone is born into a pagan family or a family that, that, that are a bunch of atheists are they are you know the fact is is that God doesn't choose based on what you believe he or what you the way that you were born but it is listen whether you or not have been confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ do you have faith do you have faith because if this man was truly a Christian from birth he most likely wouldn't been in there Right? And that's trying to, to understand that it coming to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it ultimately will change your life. It will change your behavior. Uh, and, and so if you say that you have faith or you come across people who talk about faith, 
Look at their actions. Do they have faith? Do I have faith? Uh, and that, you know, this doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. How I many you know I am an imperfect being? Going through the experiences of the last two years, three years, whatever it is, I can't tell you I have never in my life felt so weak. And it, here, you know, you always hear about, oh, I, I'm praying for you, God give you strength. Let me tell you something, I felt crushed under the weight of the trials. You know what that did to me? It made me realize how much I needed God. Because sometimes we get, begin to depend upon our own righteousness, like Brian was talking about earlier, that, you know, I'm a pretty good person, you know. Uh, you know, I don't try to hurt anybody. Or you talk to people in the world, they don't rob any banks and they never killed anybody, the two biggest sins. Because that's the two that they mention all the time, right? You go, hey, you, you know Jesus? Well, I don't kill anybody, I don't rob any banks. I'm like, that's all it takes to get into heaven? You know, <laughs> a lot of people are going to go then, right? But the fact is, is that we're not perfect. And everyone, I don't care if you're a preacher, down to, down to the, the, the person that cleans the church, we all need Jesus. We all need the grace of God. And thank God for His mercy and His grace. Let's talk, the second thing that the Apostle Paul talks about, is he, he talks about this labor of love. You know, uh, and, and, and this is the, the second thing that he commends them of, of love. And when tested by the, uh, the scribes to what, they, what was the greatest or the first commandment of all, look what Jesus says here in Mark 12, 29 through 31. Look what he says. Jesus answered him and said, First, the first and of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. He says, This is the first commandment. And the second is like it unto that, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, There is no other commandment greater than these. So, you know, and we talk about this love, and we think that, oh, you know, God, give me love for this person because I'm struggling, right? If you ever met anybody, you're like, man, that person is tough to love. But if you look this up, it isn't really talking about simply loving God with, with our emotions or loving our neighbors with our emotions. He's not talking about that. Look how God defines the word hate uh, in love when he's given the Ten Commandments. Look here in Exodus 20, 4 through 5. Look what he says here. You shall not make for yourself a carbon image, uh, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the uh, of the fathers upon the children of the third and the fourth, Generation of those who what? Hate who hate me. Now how does God define love and hate? Did he, did he define it by the emotions? Did anything in there talk about emotions? You know how he defined love and hate? By the actions. Whether people were being obedient or whether they were being disobedient. And some people might think, well, I don't hate God. Well, God defines it. It doesn't matter how you define it, but God defines you hating Him by walking in disobedience to His Word. And how does He define that whether you love Him? He defines it by your obedience to His Word. And so, when we talk about loving God with everything that's in us, He's not talking about this, this internal feelings of love for God or these, and when he talks about loving our neighbor as ourselves, he's not talking about really these feelings of love, but he's talking about we are to love in our actions. Right? He's talking about the verb form of the word. The agapal. Not agape, but the agapal. It is the, the verb form of the word love. That we are to love God in our actions we are to, and you know what? And I've always, and I've said this, and I can't tell you how many times I've said this, but it's still true, right? Is that feelings oftentimes follow action? 
if it, 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 people, when, when I would do marriage counseling, when people would come to me and they say, well, we just fell out of love with each other, you know, because they've been married for so long or whatever, and they just thought oh, we just fell out of love. You know what I would do for them? So, you know what? You need to start doing something nice for them every day. Do those works of love. And you know what? When you do works of love, your feelings for them begin to change. Your heart begins to grow fonder when you're serving one another. That's why it's so important in marriage that each serves the other. Because when you do that, you're going to keep that love alive. But if you start doing things, you start speaking against your husband or your wife, you start putting them down to your neighbors or your best friends, that's what, you know, sometimes, you know, groups like to get together and then, you know, before too long, you have a group of like three women that, that are, have a divorce and then they get another woman coming around that's her marriage is relatively good. Within a year of listening to them, guess what? They're getting a divorce, right? Because they start complaining. You start talking. And, and when you start speaking and doing actions against, those feelings begin to change for the worst. So when He tells us in His Word, to love Him with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, everything. We are to love Him with all of our, with, in, in, our, in our deeds. And let me tell you something, when you do that, your love for God will continue to grow stronger and stronger. Amen. When you do that to your neighbor, and He tells us what? To even do it to our enemies. Now, He's not telling us, I mean, if somebody murdered my kid or something, I'm going to have a tough time having feelings of love for that joker. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? When we start to forgive and we start to do things, those works, then we can finally let go. We can finally, our feelings will begin to change. And that's what's important. That, that we obey the voice of the Lord our God. He doesn't, he doesn't make this suggestion to us. He doesn't suggest that we walk in obedience, does He? It's a command. It's a command. So when he talks about, he's, he, he's, he's, he's speaking to the church of Thessalonica about love and commending them. I don't know about you, but I want God to commend me of the love that we have for his people. Amen. And the last thing that he talks about is the patience of hope. How many know that hope is a powerful thing? Hope is a powerful thing. Look here in Romans 8.24 For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Listen, I talked to a person recently who uh, talked about taking their life. That life just didn't, you know, just was in a very bad place. And I, I began to talk to this person about hope. After my wife died, I, I, can, I can say within that month, I'm looking at life and I'm thinking, life just doesn't seem worth living. I look at what we built together. We spent the whole life building stuff together and none of that mattered. Not a single thing that I had owned mattered at all. And I often thought it was unfair that here we spent all this time and all of this and then I get to go on. I get to see our children continue to grow. I get to see our grandchildren grow. And she's not going to see that. And I got to the point where I'm just like, life just simply didn't seem worth living. It just didn't. I, didn't, I wouldn't have done anything to myself, but I know this, if I were to die, I wouldn't have cared. I really would not have cared. But then my life changed. And when, when my life changed, there was hope. That you know what? There's a future. There's something more. And I realized how powerful hope is. Because hope for something better. When there's no hope and you just can't see past that darkness. And I don't know who I'm speaking to. I hope somebody listening, whether it's on YouTube or whatever. But the fact is, is that if you're in a difficult place right now, don't do anything rash. You know what? It can change in a moment of time. Just as my life 
went into this darkness when my wife died, my life was changed just within a few days. And then all of a sudden, the, the future seemed so much brighter. And so when we talk about hope, even though you may be going through a difficult time right now, the fact is, is that things change. And that there is a hope for a better future. Not, even, not just in this life here. Of course we have the hope to be with our Lord and Savior when we pass. But He can give us hope for a future even here. Yes. And, and, and the Apostle Paul, he commended the church. Faith, hope, and love. And these are powerful things. I want to, walk, I want to be a church known for our love. I'm going to hope, I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to hope because I know what? I know that these, 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 this place one day, it's going to be filled with people who truly love the Lord, Amen. who are eager to hear the word of God. Amen. And that we, we walk in, in love with one another. No matter, no matter if politicians want to try to rip us apart and separate us, because that's all they're doing, that, that we're not going to fall for that. We're going to love each other no matter what, because they're child of God. Amen? Because they're children of God. So let us, when we stand before the Lord one day, because all of us will, I don't know about you, but I want to be commended on these, th these three things. And I want these to be our focus here. Amen? Amen. I'm going to end with that. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word today. I thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. I pray, Father, that you would fill this church, Lord, with love. That you would fill this church full of hope, Father. That our faith would continue to grow stronger and stronger in you. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done in our lives. Father, even the difficult days. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us out of those difficult days. And, Father, that there is a brighter future ahead. I thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.